Fine. All right. Now, today we're talking about, I remember last time we talked about the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, we talked about we the Holies of Holies. And we talked about the Ark of the Covenant. And we talked about the place itself. Hallelujah. And today, it was just part six, which is the last part. And we're going to talk about the articles of the Ark of the Covenant. Amen. Because the Ark of the Covenant is just a box. It's a box, but it represents Jesus um, as uh, um, uh, Jesus Christ. As you see, the wood itself, the acacia wood, which presents the humanity of Jesus, but indestructible. Uh, which acacia wood is an indestructible wood. And so it represents the, the indestructible nature of Jesus Christ. Amen. And then covered by gold, which is the royalty of Jesus himself. Praise the Lord. And then you have uh, uh, the mercy seat, and then you have the cherubims on top of the mercy seat. Amen. Uh, and then we see that the uh, uh, priest, the high priest, will go once a year to uh, put the blood of goats and lambs on top of the mercy seat for the redemption uh, of sin, for that, not redemption, for the atonement of sin. Hallelujah. Just for one year. Just for one year. It's like you're paying your mortgage just for one year. After a year, you have to go back and pay it again. Amen. Or your car registration is for a year. And then after a year, you have to go back again. Amen. And so the priest used to go and do that every year to go and atone for the sins of Israelites for one year. And God will withhold, withheld his, his uh, anger on Israelites for one year. Amen. And we saw the consequences of opening the covenant or touching the covenant, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Last week, we looked at the dangers of looking inside the Ark of the Covenant. Hallelujah. We saw in the book of, uh, um, I think, uh, Numbers, if I'm not mistaken, when uh, Beth Shemeth, uh, the clan of Beth Shemeth, they decided to touch the Ark of the Covenant and open the Ark of the Covenant. Fifteen 57,000 people die in one sitting. Hallelujah. So we don't want to do that. What, what we want to talk about, we want to talk about what is inside the Ark of the Covenant. Because it is very, very important. There are three things that God ordained to be in the Ark of the Covenant. Amen. Three things that God ordained to be inside the Ark of the Covenant. Number one is, you all remember? Okay. There are three things. One, there's a pot of manna. Number two, there is a rod of Aaron. Not just any rod, the rod that budded overnight. Amen. And then number three, there was ten commandments. Praise the name of the Lord. Number one, a pot of manna, a pot of gold that contains manna inside. And then number two, there was Aaron's rod. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Emma. Aaron's rod that budded almonds uh, overnight. And then number three, there was the Ten Commandments that God wrote himself with his finger. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, this, this, if you look at this, there are two sides to, to what is inside there. One it represents the provision of God. And on the flip side to that, it speaks on the rebellion of men. Hallelujah. It speaks to rebellion of men. Number one, it speaks of God's provision. Number two, rebellion of men. Hallelujah. Now, if we go to Exodus chapter 16... Verse 11 and 12, it said, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israelites. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. You shall know that I am the Lord your God. So manna was sent by God because of the complaints of the Israelites. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They were sent by God because Israelites complained to God that we are tired, we are hungry, we are all this, blah, 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 and said, okay, now you're going to eat meat and be filled with manna every day. 
I will sustain you. Praise the name of the Lord. I will sustain you. Now, this shows the provision of God that God himself decided to feed his children. Even today, God still feeds his children. Even until today. That's why Jesus said, do not worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear because your father in heaven already knows what you need. And so if God himself knows what I need, that means I don't have to ask for my needs. I have to ask for what his need for me is. I have to find his will for my life because what I need has already been taken care of. I don't have to ask anymore for what I need because that God has already accounted for it before. All I need to do is find myself in him and look at what I represent in him. What is his will over my life? Then when I find his will over my life that is seeking him, then everything else that pertains to my life and provisions that I need in life, God will add to me. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. That's why the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all the things that you need will be added. That God has already planned for it. There's nothing that you have to ask for. You don't have to fast and pray for bread. No, you fast and pray to get close to God and to know him better and to know his will over your life much better. Praise the name of the Lord. Because when you're fasting for, pray, for bread and, and fruits and, and what you're going to wear, you're misplacing your prayers. You're misplacing your what? Your prayers. Your prayers are supposed to get you close to God. Whenever you're close to God, things start to be smaller. Your issues start to begin to seem so small. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. If I take a soccer ball or a basketball and I put it on my face, it's going to, that the same size or circumference is going to be big on my face. But if I take it far away from me, it's going to seem small. Every time the basketball, if I, if I give the basketball to, uh, uh, to my wife and it was like, go far away from me. If I see from that, it's going to, the size is going to be the same size, but it's going to be smaller than what it is on my face. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. That means every time I get close to God, he becomes much bigger. God does not change. We change positions. Now, because we change positions, he seems so small to us. And our problem is much bigger is because we have changed our position. And our posture has changed, but God did not change. He is incapable of change. That's immutability of God. He is incapable of change. Praise the name of the Lord. That's why in the book of Numbers it says, I am not a man that I should not what? Lie. He is incapable of telling a lie. And he is incapable of change. He remains the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But the problem is we change. As human, we evolve. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, in, our, uh, in, our, in the process of evolving, in the process, we forget our state of being, which is you in Christ Jesus. That's where the problem begins. When you forget who you are, that's where the problem begins. But God does not change. Okay, let me take you to the book of Kings. When God met Gideon, and he told Gideon who he is, and Gideon started fighting himself for who he is. What do you mean I'm a mighty warrior? 
What, what do you mean, God? I'm a mighty warrior. How? First of all, I'm the least in my clan. I am small. I am hiding at this point because the enemy has kicked me, has kicked my butt so hard, I, I'm, I'm afraid to go out. But you're calling me a mighty warrior? This it does not equate. Math isn't mathing. Hallelujah. It is strange. You start, to hear, you start to find the voice of the Lord so strange to you because you don't believe yourself. You don't believe who you are. The posture has changed. You have changed position. And because you have changed position, God seems to be so small because he's so far away from you. When he says, seek me first, he say, seek that ball. Run to it. When you seek him, now the size to your face, it becomes bigger. But God does not change size. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And so God decided, said, I will provide for you. I will sustain you up until today. Whatever it is that you need. Rent, money, sicknesses. Your education, your provision, your business, everything has been accounted for. When you're asking God, you ask God. If you look at the prayers of Jesus, not one prayer he prayed about the coin, the money that they have to pay for taxes. I, I don't know if I'm reading the, the, the different Bible. Did he pray for the coin? Did he pray for money to pay taxes? No. But look at his prayer when he came to, uh, to the, the grave of Lazarus. He didn't even pray. He just said, thank you, Lord, because you have heard me. Uh, thank you, God, because you have already heard me. That means we had a prayer conversation about this event right now. So I don't need to prove myself in prayer at this moment in time. And start, um, and start fighting and make noise so everybody will know. But all I'm saying, you've already heard me and you already know my need. Jesus said, thank you because you've already, you already heard me. But I'm doing this not for me, it is for them to believe. When he told Peter, go get the coin, he just told him, go get the coin. The first fish that you pick up, open his mouth, get the coin and pay. That was it. There was no prayer involved in it. Am I making sense? Why? Because God has already provided. But because he has already provided, here's the thing now. We need faith. To activate and access what has already been stored up for us. <laughs> Hallelujah. We need what? Faith. To access what is, has already been stored up for us. So when we seek God, we are being elevated in our faith. Our faith is elevated. And now when our faith is elevated, then I can command things that are not there as though they were. And so when I say something, I don't say it because it is in my head. No, no. I say it because, as I said last week, it's already in eternity. has already been supplied to be in eternity. And so when I speak it, I speak it because it is already there. It is invisible in my eyes, but it is physically and spiritually there. And so when I speak, I'm, I'm in trouble and I need rent. I need to speak in my spiritual sense and in my spiritual, uh, 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 in my heart and say, in the name of Jesus, devil, take your hand off my money, even though I have $200 in my account. And I call. Whoever has been assigned. 
for this provision to come. Here's another good thing. God blesses people through people. Hence, love thy neighbor as yourself. The neighbor that you hate, that you despise, they're the ones that are going to pay your rent. The neighbor that you hate and despise, they're the ones that are going to help you with your job, your next job. The ones that you hate and you despise, they're the ones that are going to help you build up your company. The neighbor that you despise, they say, oh, they're nothing, they're nothing, they're nothing. They're the ones that are going to sit behind you on the other side of the table with you and negotiate your contract. You never know. Do not despise nobody. That's why God said, love your neighbor. It's because at, that, at some point, you will meet them. Not in this capacity, but in a different capacity. And you never know who you're sitting next to. Ooh, that's, a, that's a lesson my father told me a long time ago. You never know you, who you're sitting next to. And you never know who you meet. Never despise anybody. Treat everybody with respect. Treat everybody with honor. Treat everybody as you, you want to be treated. Nobody is above you. Nobody is beneath you. All of them are the same. God says, I'm not a respecter person. And he is not. Hallelujah. And he is not. And so, manna represented the rebellion of men when they rebelled against God. That you've taken us from Egypt and brought us in this place and you want to kill us. And we're tired of eating this thing. God has given you a job and then you start complaining. I'm tired of this job. <laughs> I wake up every day. I'm tired. Every time I get into my place, my boss is on my neck every time. God, I don't understand. If it, is this you? I think this is the devil who gave me this job. I know this is not, this is not what I signed up for. For six months you've cried out for a job and God gave you a job. And now you start complaining. I know God, this is not you at all. This is... This, this is the devil himself. The devil himself has come. That, that in the name of Jesus, you start binding and rebuking things. And God is like, are you serious? You wanted a job, I give you a job. It is a job I assigned it for you. So it would sustain you for a moment. But us, ungrateful us, we want what we want. And I expect nothing less. <laughs> There's that commercial that says, I expect to be delighted. <laughs> I expect to be delighted. That's the attitude we go with God. But that's not what God wants of us. You have to understand, everything in our life has already been predestined. According to Romans 8. Has already been what? Predestined. And so, God establishes from beginning. Remember, Chapter 0 of Genesis. Before the beginning was, God was. And the Bible says, before everything started, before the angels were created, before anything came to being, Paul gives us a very good picture. And he says, God said to himself, he had a meeting with himself. And he laid out a plan of redemption for all men. And so, right now, what we're doing, we're leaving God's history. It's not God working things out as we go. No. God has already predestined our way. The problem is, again, we're moving positions. Getting out of God's will or God, out, out of God's way. If I want to get from, my, from this church to my house, if I put in a GPS, the GPS will tell me. Take Campbell all the way down to George Bush. Take George Bush two miles out. And then take 78. Go down 78. Then take Oak Street. You get to your house. Easy. But our life. I want to go from here to Wiley. The GPS tells me, take Campbell. All I'm doing is, you know what? Ah. <sighs> Too complicated. So I will take 
I will go down to 75. And I will go down all the way to Dallas, downtown Dallas. I will try to go to Arlington. But I, even though I know my, I need to be in Wiley, but I will take Arlington. I will go all the way. I'll take 20. I will go up 20 all the way to Texarkana. And I will come back. You see what we do? God has already ordained that road for us to take. But because of our own desires, we take another road. We reroute what God has already planned. And so he pleads with us at any, every day, every day, come back to my will. Come back to the way. Come back. The GPS gives us, turn back, turn back, turn back. Turn. You know what? You can take two miles now and turn back. But he said, nah, that's not what I want to do. I know I'm not the only one. Hallelujah. And that is the state of our life. But God has already offered what? Provision. Praise the Lord. Lord. Hallelujah. So in Exodus 16, 32 to 35. Then Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Feel an omer with it to be kept for your generation that you may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer of manna on it and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for generations as the Lord commanded Moses. So Aaron laid up before the testimony, which is the Ark of a Covenant, to be kept. And the children of Israel ate manna 40 years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. John 6, verse 32 to verse 33. Jesus said this, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Who is that? Jesus Hallelujah. And so God, Jesus starts to giving us the revelation of what was done thousands of years before, before he came. He says, no, no, you see what Moses was doing? It was just representation of me. I am the bread of life. Hallelujah. I am the bread of life. When the devil tested him in Matthew chapter 4, he says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. What is the word of God? Jesus. What is the bread of God? Jesus. And so, that means we are being sustained by Jesus. Every day of our life, our sustenance is, 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 is dependent on what Jesus say about us. Give us this day our daily bread, our daily portion of mercy, our daily portion of grace, our daily portion of power. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So when Jesus came and walked on earth, he became God's provision to us, the manna, the bread from heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for being the bread that I don't need to look far for you. All I can just do is look inside myself because the Bible says when you accept me as Lord and Savior of your life, I and my Father will make a dwelling in your heart that I don't have to ask for more. I don't have to go to a certain place to seek God. All I can do is inside myself at that very moment, I'm with Jesus. Hallelujah. Number two, Aaron's rod. Number 16 to 17. Number 17, verse 8 to 10. It says, the next day Moses entered the tent and saw Aaron's stuff, which represented the tribe of Levi, and not only sprouted 
but had budded, blossomed, and produced almonds. The, then Moses brought out all the stuff from the Lord's presence to all the Israelites. They looked at them, and each of them, each of the leaders took his own staff. The Lord said to Moses, put back Aaron's stuff in front of the ark of a covenant law of covenant of the law to be kept as a sign of what rebellious then this will put an end to the grumbling against me so that they will not die moses did did just as the lord commanded so let, let me give you a backstory to this the backstory to this is in number 16, they started complaining. You know, remember Korah? Korah uh, 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 colluded with some of the people in the Israelites camp. And they wanted to uh, dethrone, pretty much, take over uh, Moses' position and Aaron's position because they were tired of them. Well, we're tired of you guys. We're tired. <laughs> Ooh, let me not go here. I'm tired of this pastor. I'm tired of this preacher. I'm tired of this teacher. I'm tired of this. They literally, this did not start yesterday. It started thousands of years ago. They were the Israelites were tired of Moses and Aaron. The very people that God chose and put in that position. They did the same way back in the days of Samuel. They rejected God and they say, we want a king for ourselves." And, and Samuel went to God and said, this is what they say. And they say, okay. They did not reject you. They rejected me. So every time you go against what God has ordained, you are going against God. You don't want that fight. You don't want that fight. David was clever enough. He says, I will not touch the anointed. Even when he had a chance to kill him, destroy him, cut his head, and go back home a free man. He had all the chance. But he said, do not touch the anointed. Because even though the Holy Spirit is not on him anymore, the presence of God, He's still with him. He was still God's anointed. Ah, let me, okay, let me, let me stay here real quick. Let me teach you something. There are three types of anointing. Okay? This three, yeah, yeah. Three types of anointing. Number one, the anointing that you receive for your salvation. When you change your life or when you accept Jesus as Lord and personal Savior of your life. There's an anointing God has released for your sustenance as a Christian to sustain you through your life of, of, of believing. Hallelujah. That produces faith that helps you in your growth. That helps you to pray. Hallelujah. And then there's an anointing inside of you. The anointing inside of you Gives you, makes the presence of God always present in your life. Okay, let me say that one more time. There's an anointing that helps you to be converted to be a Christian. To be a follower of Christ or a believer. And helps you. And then the second type of anointing is anointing in you. That anointing keeps the presence of God with you at all times. Hallelujah. And so when you cry, God help me. God is not out there. He's inside of you. So you always have a presence of God whenever you move. Praise the name of the Lord. And then there's a third type of anointing. The anointing that comes on you. The anointing that comes on you is for a specific office or for a specific purpose. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so, let me go back. The anointing that sustained Saul 
as a king was the anointing inside of him. Because the Holy Spirit left him the second year of his reign. When he rebelled. But the anointing of God, that anointing that Eli, uh, Samuel, poured on him. That anointing was for him and on. But when the Holy Spirit left, the anointing on him left. But the anointing in him stayed. That's why he reigned for over 40 years without the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. When Samuel anointed David, David, the Bible says this, that David, the whole, and he anointed, the Holy Spirit came upon David and never left him. That's why when David sinned with a woman and had a baby with him, when God told him about it, he cried one thing, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Why? Because he understood that the anointing in him is not going to sustain him. But the anointing on him is going to sustain him. And so he cried, did not take your spirit away from me. Because if you do, I am absolutely nothing. I am done. I will be a Christian, but no power. I'll be a Christian, but no fruits. I'll be a Christian, but no works. I'll be a Christian, but no evidence. I will come and sit on a pews every day, but no evidence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is the presence of God. When Moses said, when God told him, now take my people to the desert. He says, no, 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 I, I, I'm not going if you're not coming with us. If your presence does not go with us, do not send us out away from here. Hallelujah. And so, they rejected. Korah uh, came, uh, they, they colluded with some of the, the leaders, and they decided to take over the mantle, replace Moses. And when Moses heard about this, he cried, and he went to God, and God's anger was aroused. And God wanted to destroy the entire nation. But Moses went back to God quickly and said, Lord, please, these people did not do anything. It's only the fault of very few people. Please take them. And God said, well, very well, this is what I'm going to do. Call all the tribes, all 12 tribes to come in front of me. Call them close to the temple, to the tent. And then let the ones who were uh, who brought trouble, there are like 250 of them. Imagine. Im imagine. Out of 3 million people, 250 people did not like Moses. And, and I'm sure the number was even higher than 250, but the Bible recorded 250 people, 250 men. Hallelujah. And so he called them close, and God opened up. He says, get away from Korah and his family and his tent. Make sure nobody touches it. Nobody goes close to it. Separate him and their family and the livestock and everything. Set it on the side. And when he did, the Bible says, and the earth opened its mouth. That means there was an earthquake. And the Bible says they went into the realm of the dead alive. <laughs> Hallelujah. Like there was an earth split. <sighs> opened. Korah and his family and the people that rebelled were swallowed when. The Bible records that they went into the realm of the dead while they were still alive. So once it swallowed them, the earth came back. Hallelujah. And then, after that, they continued. To, they went back to Moses. And said, you are the one who killed these people. Said, no, no, no. You, 
You say, how can I open the land? How? Like how? This is not, but I guess it, it's logical because they saw him part of the Red Sea. So probably they figured, you know, you did this. And God says he killed 250 people because of what they did. Hallelujah. And when they complain, he says, I, I don't want to hear these complaints anymore. I want the leaders of the tribe to bring their stuff and take him to the, to the holies of holies and leave them there. And Moses came in the morning. These were dry trees. Dry. Because you can't use the stuff which is wet. So dry. In the morning, only Aaron's rod budded with almond trees. A representation of Jesus. And it, God told Moses, leave Aaron's stuff in there. But this will be a sign of their rebellion. But it will also show that I am their shepherd. Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Hallelujah. And so Aaron's rod were there, was left there. And so it was included as what uh, to the in in the, um, in the furniture that God wanted to be uh, to stay as 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 a remembrance for generations to come. Again, God is not only concerned about you; He's concerned about your generation. He's not only concerned about you, and the devil is not even concerned about you. He's concerned about your children. When he hits you and confuses you, he's going after your children. Hallelujah! He's going after your children. It's because if he is able to defile them while they are young, they will never know God. They will never worship him. And then the next generation, they will continue not knowing God. That means you're continuing that root of rebellion. Hallelujah. And so sometimes you, have, you fight so much walls, so much walls. But the devil is not really concerned about you. He's concerned about your children. He wants your children, the generations to come. God said, put this in remembrance so that the generations will come and know and see that I took them from Egypt to the promised land. Hallelujah. And so Hebrews 4, 14 says this. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, who is that? Jesus, who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was, all, was in all points tested and tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace for in time of need. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But Christ has indeed raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. But he came back to life like Aaron's budding rod, the first fruits from the dead. That's Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. John 11, 25 to 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And so when you see Aaron's rod dried in the evening, budded with fruits in the morning, representation of what? Jesus. He says he is a life. He is a resurrection. That means Aaron's rod was resurrected from the dead. From being dry tree to a fruitful tree. Hallelujah. I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me, though he may what? Die, he shall live again. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Hallelujah. Shall never what? Die. And so, number one, manna, God's our provision. Number two, God's our lead or our guide. 
or our shepherd. Praise the Lord. The Lord. And number three, Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, God's law and standard of living. They rejected God's law and the standard of living. Matthew 5, 17 to 18. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. This was Jesus telling the people. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappears, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. John 6, 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Praise the name of the Lord. Ten commandments, representation of God's uh, guidance and standard of living. He wanted people, in, in Hebrew, they don't call it commandment, they call it sayings. These are ten sayings of God. You call, they don't call it commandments. These are ten sayings of God. That's what they, they call it. It's ten sayings, but meaning it, it, it takes it from you have to to I'm giving you this option to follow this. He already say life and death is at the point of your, at the tip of your tongue. In front of you, there is life. In front of you, there is death. I urge you to choose life. And so God established the Ten Commandments in saying as a standard of living. As a standard that every uh, Israelite should follow and every believer should follow. And he wanted this, again, to stay in remembrance for generations to come. Praise the name of the Lord. For generations to come. But here's a good thing. In the days of Solomon, when Solomon, Solomon built the temple of the Lord that stood for many, many years. Now they moved from a tent because there are three uh, uh, tabernacles that remember we talked about. Number one was Mosaic. And then number two was Davidic or David. And then the three, the third one is Solomon, Solomon's temple. And so when Solomon built this temple, the Bible says in the first Kings that when the Ark of the Covenant was installed in that temple, the rod of Aaron was not there. The pot of manna was not there. What was there? Only what? The two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb. Hallelujah. That means God cares more about righteousness and his way of when you how to live in this world than anything else. Because he already knows that he's your shepherd. He already knows that he is your what? Provision. He wants you to follow the standards. He says, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel, when they came out of the land of Egypt, and it came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. So the priests could not continue to offer or minister because the cloud was so thick, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. What happened between those years? The Bible does not record. But I will presume, probably when he was taken to Philistine, remember the story. In 1 Samuel chapter 6, when he went to, 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 the, to when the Philistine captured the Israelites and they took the Ark of the Covenant to, the, to Philistine and they put it in Dagon's temple. When they woke up in the morning, God Dagon fell down. And they decided to lift up Dagon again. Came back in the early in the morning. Dagon fell down. This time, lost his head, lost his arm. Hallelujah. And they started getting blisters. The Bible says God uh, allowed that the angel of death will, and the infirmity will come upon them. And they started getting blisters and people died. And they moved it to another place. People died there. And they moved to another place. People died there. Until they put it on the calf. Decided, you know what? We're not going to deal with this. They put it on the, on the cart 
and let the, uh, the, 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 the uh, cows pull it to where it's supposed to go. And then they met, they came, it came to Beth Shemeth when they t decided to open the Ark of the Covenant. And 50,000 people died. Hallelujah. And so, God says, in this time, I want you to remember one thing. That my law is more important. Oh, yeah. Ooh, you're quick, Emma. Thank you. Oh, bring, bring that back. So this is how they sent it out. Cows put the cart, <laughs> cut of milk, the Ark of a Covenant, because nobody could touch it. And then if you see the box here, here is a box filled with rats, golden rats. <laughs> As a sin offering to God. It was filled with golden rats and something else. I can't remember right now. But this card right here. It was a sin offering. And when it came to Shemeth, they offered it. They wanted God to forgive them. And when it was received and they offered the sacrifices, they took the two cows and offered them before the Lord. And those the golden rats and something else inside the box. When they offered, the plague start, stopped. Hallelujah. And so God wanted. We don't know if at this time that the rod was removed or when it gets to Bethlehem, when it was removed, the Bible does not tell us. But we know, but at the time when Solomon was building the temple, only the tablets were in there. Hallelujah. And I want you to pay attention on something here. As I'm closing. I want you to pay attention to this. Ima, if you bring up the Ark of a Covenant with me. I want you to look at this. It's extremely important. This is the Ark of a Covenant. Well, a representation or a picture of what it is. For how it was. You see the light that God is in there. You see the tablet, the pot of gold with manna, and the rod of Aaron inside. But I want you to pay attention to something. That box is closed. The only way to See what's inside the Ark of the Covenant. You have to remove the mercy seat. That means the rebellion of Israel, the rebellion of his children was hidden under the mercy of God. Our rebellion, our sin is hidden under the mercies of God. The priest will come and put blood over here. That's why he was killed. 50,000 people died when they tried to open the mercy seat in Bethlehem. In 1 Samuel chapter 6. When they tried to open, because when you open that thing, you're removing the mercies of God over your life. And the wrath of God will fight you. 50,000 people died in a minute because they looked inside without the mercy. That means the law now applies. That's why Paul says we're not living under the law anymore. We're living under the grace. And whenever we live under the grace, we should never fulfill the, what, the, the, the ones of the flesh. Mercy is above the law, above the rebellion, above our sin. The mercies of God. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 4, it says, You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away. Ooh, bring that back. You have fallen away from where? Grace. You have fallen away from what? Grace. Look at this. 
You who have tried to justify yourself, you have fallen, because here that's where grace is. But you have fallen away because you want to what? Live in law. May God help us stay under his mercy and his grace. And here's a good news. Jesus is the one who has what? Sealed it. The cherubims, they're looking at the blood. God is looking at the blood. He speaks from a place of blood. That's his son. And so Jesus, when he says, when you pray, ask the Father through my name. And whenever you do that, he will hear you. He is pleased when you do that. Because only through Jesus that redemption comes. Only through Jesus, grace is released. Only through Jesus. Hebrews 9, 11 to 15, he says, But Christ came as a high priest of good things to come with greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made by human hands. That is not a cre this creation. Not with the blood of goats or calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holiest of place for once and for all to obtain eternal what? Redemption. Eternal redemption. Pay attention to that word. Eternal redemption. Redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of heifer sprinkling of the unclean sanctifies the pure and purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ hold through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God? Again, he repeats, eternal, eternal. For this reason, he is a mediator of a new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant. That those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Why is it saying eternal? Why is it saying eternal? There are a couple things. Number one. There are seven types of covenants. Seven types of what? Covenants. Number one is Adamic covenant that God made in the days of Abraham. He made with Abraham. Hallelujah. And number two, after Abraham, there's Noah covenant that God made with Noah. Number three, he made a covenant with Abraham. Number four, he made a covenant with Moses. Number five, he made a covenant with David. Number six, there is a new covenant with Jesus now sealed. Number seven, eternal covenant. That is what the Bible talks about, eternal, eternal, eternal. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you following me? I'm going somewhere. Eternal covenant. In every covenant... There are three things. There's a promise, there's a conditions, and there's a seal. He told Abraham, he told uh, uh, Adam, multiply. That is a promise. Have dominion. Number two, a condition. Do not eat of that tree. Don't eat of that tree. And number three, he was supposed to be sealed, but never did. Why? Because the cherubim went in front of the tree of knowledge, of life. And he says, no, you can't get past here. Because once they ate, if they ate from the tree of life, they will be sealed in eternal sin. As the devil is sealed in sin. God says, let them not eat of the tree of life. 
so that they will not remain in sin. Years later, Jesus showed up. He says, now I'm bringing, I'm giving you a new covenant. But this new covenant is not by anybody else, but between myself and I. I'm making this covenant with me, myself, and I. So that nobody will break it. And I'm going to seal it with myself. By the blood of Jesus. He sealed his own covenant. And then he says this, by the Holy Spirit. That this covenant is also sealed. So there are two people who sealed the covenant that was supposed to be sealed back in the days. He reversed it and said, now I'm going to seal it. But I'm not going to seal it with any other covenant. I'm going to seal it with the redemption of men. The man who fell thousands of years. Now I have redeemed it and I'm sealing it with my own blood. And I'm sending the Holy Spirit to be as a guarantee, an insurance policy. Shit. I'm sending the Holy Spirit as what? Insurance policy. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. If, Ima can, if you can pull that up, sir. I know it's not in my notes, but if you can pull it up, sir. As I'm finishing. Ephesians chapter 1. In verse 13. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, that ga, ga, ga. fast. Thank you. And now you are what? You Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves, and you who worship and believe in Christ and identified as his own, giving you the Holy Spirit home. What translation is this? Man, come on now. Can you pull King James Version? Ah. New King James Version. See, you're just wrong, Emma. Just wrong, bro. In him, you also what trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having been be having believed, you are what? Woo! Sealed with what? The Holy Spirit of what? Promise. Let's continue. Who is what? The guarantee. Ah, that Jesus is coming back again. Guarantee of my inheritance until the redemption of purchased possession to the praise of his glory. That means I have a guarantee. Whenever the Holy Spirit is on, it's, it's to my remembering that I have a guarantee that Jesus is coming back again. And I'm an heir to the throne of God. The Bible says, as promised me, together with Jesus Christ, we are heir to the throne. We are co-heirs to the throne of grace. So let nobody tell you otherwise. When the devil comes at you, tell him to his face. In the name of Jesus, you are not an heir to the throne of God. I am. You are not much bigger than me. No, I am. The Bible says he has lifted, he has given his son the name above all other names. And with that name, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus is what? Lord. That means every time I speak his name, every knee must bow. Every cancer must bow. Every trouble must bow. Every sickness must bow. Everything that troubles my life must bow. Depression must bow. Anxiety must bow. Fear must bow. Because I am speaking the voice and the name of the creator. That means creation has to bow. That's why Peter walked on water. Because the creator told him, come. And you can do much, much more. Much more. Much more. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God has given you 
all these promises for you to exercise on this earth. What I'm seeing is that people have not learned to exercise their rights. They don't know how to exercise their rights. And that is the greatest strategy. Greatest tragedy in human history. That people are not able to exercise their rights in the kingdom. Believers are not able to exercise their rights. If you know who, do you know the devil is afraid of you? Do you know that the devil is afraid of you? I, now I'm not speaking this hypothetically. Neither am I not joking. Okay. No, no, no. The devil is literally afraid of you. Because of the position that you are, the position that you occupy. The Bible says in Ephesians, we are seated at the right hand with, of God with Christ. That is my position in the spirit. That means I have authority over everything. If Jesus can say, you die and the tree died, that means I have the same authority over trees. That means I have the same authority over things in my life. And so the Bible did not say, pray whatever to cast the devil. No, he said this, resist the devil. Pretty much say against it. And so when it comes, resist. But the only problem is we don't know the constitution. That gives us those rights. In this country, people, I'm how many uh, 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 articles in, in, in the Constitution of the United States? I'm, I, I don't know. This, but right now, if, if you tell people, if you ask people, they know the First Amendment because of their guns. They know the second one and the third one. But the other ones, I don't know. But because they don't know, they're missing out on their rights. Hallelujah. They're missing out on their rights. Let me teach, let me tell you something. When, the, the, when we moved into our, to our, to our first house, uh, I think it was a, a month or weeks after. I think it was a month after. There was a hail. It, we're in Texas. We get hails. It was hell, very bad hell that my wife's uh, uh, building had to shut down because the, the, the hell came down with balls like big, destroyed cars, buildings, and huh, golf balls. They were huge, destroyed a lot of things. And I'm thankful to God that, well, I'm not thankful, but uh, <laughs> it hit our house. It wasn't as bad as our neighbors, but it hit our house. And so we stayed with, with this roof that was not good and we did not know how to fix it for many, many years. I think it was like two years. I think it was a, a year or something until a guy came to our door and said, uh, do you know you have insurance and you can get this roof fixed? And I was like, oh, we did not know. I say, yeah, they can give you money to fix your roof. Of course, there's copay, but they, you have money to pay for your roof. Replace your roof. We've been living in this house fearful that if something, <laughs> something happens, rain will come in. <laughs> I know. It, it was insane. But every time I, I hear the rain outside, I'm like, oh my God, I hope, I'm praying that this thing does not come to my house. Because I'm thinking, that's, that's 15000 How? Where am I going to get this money right now? But it was only accounted for when I paid for the house. And I did not know. 
And so I lived in fear for all that time until the roofer came and said, do you know that you have this right? It changed our life. Now, this is my job every Sunday <laughs> and every day is to remind you that do you know that you have this right? <laughs> that the Bible says those that believe these signs shall follow them that believe. Do you know that you are heir to the throne of God? Do you know that you are more powerful than you think you are? That is your right. Do not let it slip away from you. Just like our listener is closing his ears right now. He just doesn't want to hear what I went through. Jesus is also, mama, no, no, no. It's, it's been, my people perish because of what? Lack of knowledge, not anointing. Knowledge. Which knowledge? The right. Your right. Hallelujah. The enemy is afraid to, for you to find out who you are. So he will always confuse you. You are not this. You are not that. You are not beautiful enough. You are not strong enough. You don't have money. First of all, you're black. First of all, you're white. Second of all, you're an immigrant. Second of all, you're this. He will give you all the rap shit. I'm like, oh my God, do I, I am disadvantaged at every point. Where do I start? I don't know. I don't even know how to start this company. I don't know because everybody keeps telling me, you can't do it. But God has already provisioned it for you before the foundation of the earth were laid. Imagine that God knew Tracy will open up a billion dollar business. If he can just stay in this GPS, in this route that I have for her, if she stays here at some point when her faith is strengthened, she will command something to happen. I have already ordained it. But we're taking detours. I want to do me, Lord. Your plan doesn't really apply to me. I don't think you understand my vibe right now. You understand? I don't think you understand how I live. You don't understand. This world right now has changed and has evolved. You, God, have to also evolve with me. The tactics that were there thousands of years ago are not going to apply now, God. So you are somehow, you have to change with times. God says, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But if you change yourself and stay on this course that I have already ordained for you and learn, have an understanding of this word that you say it is too old, that you see the power that will come out of it. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to remind you of who you are. You are not a failure. You are not a failure. You are meant to do something in this world. You are born with purpose. You are born with an assignment. And that assignment will take you much higher and farther than you ever dreamed of. The Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. What God has planned has already ordained and predestined for those that love him. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at yourself and say, I am more than what I'm thinking I am. I am more. I am more. I am more. I am more than what the world says about me. You only have one standard, God's standard. Every other standard is low. God's standard stands. Praise the Lord. And so I want you to understand, as we are closing, we're closing this series. My prayer is that you see the image of Jesus in every 
every part of your life. As God ordained the tabernacle to represent his son, I want you to also know that you are already the temple of the Holy Spirit. That means he has already ordained you to represent Christ. The Bible says in the book of Psalms 104 that he has clothed you with light. That's why Jesus called you the light of the world. He has clothed you with, oh geez, you're fast. He has clothed you with light. Bless the Lord of my soul. Oh God, you are very great. You are you clothe me. You clothe with honor and majesty. Who covers yourself with light as with a garment who stretched out the heavens like a curtain. Today, it is a new day. Decide today that I'm not going to be a failure. That I'm not going to listen to what the world says, but I'm going to stand and know. I'm going to read the word. I'm going to stand and know my rights in the kingdom of God. That I'll be able to exercise my rights. Whenever the situation comes against me, I will exercise as Jesus said, it is written. You also say, it is written. You will not be defeated. You are not created to be defeated. You are created to win. You are created to what? Win. Hallelujah. Can you all stand up? <laughs> Heavenly Father, I give you praise and I give you glory. And I thank you for your presence in this place. Father, you have reminded us today. You have reminded us today of who we are in Christ Jesus. Father, Everything that pertains to our life represents Jesus. You have said and you have commanded us as we are the salt of the world. We are the light of the world. A city on a hill in the name of Jesus. From today, each and every one of us, oh Father. Each and every one of us, oh Lord. Each and every one of us, oh my Savior. That we will experience the light of God in the name of Jesus. We'll exude the light of life that is coming out of us. As the Holy Spirit comes upon us, oh Lord. For our offices in the name of Jesus. We will not back down. We will stand face to face. We will stand face to face with our enemy. We will stand face to face with our, to our problems. We will stand face to face with depression. We will stand face to face with issues in our life. And say, I am a warrior. I am victorious. Father, I thank you. And I give you all the glory. Father. Remind me and remind them, my Father, of who they are. Remind them, my Father, that they are your children. Remind them, the Lord, they are the high priest. Remind them, oh God, that they are the children of God. Remind them of where their position is. Remind them, my Father, of what their role is in the kingdom of God. Remind them, my Father, of what they play. Remind them, oh God, of who Jesus is to them. The Father will always walk in victory. Never defeated. But stand in the presence of God, as we come to you boldly, as the Bible has commanded us, come to you boldly, that we can obtain mercy and grace in times of trouble. Father, I give you praise. I thank you and I pray for them, O oh Father, that this word will bring light and life into the hearts will bring transformation of their heart. Will all, Father, elevate them, O Father, in their faith. Set them, O Lord, on a solid rock that will not be shaken. In the name of Jesus, as they continue to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God, the Lord, you show yourself powerful in their life. From this day forth, in Jesus' wonderful name, I pray and I thank you. Amen. If you guys want to be seated for a moment, we're going to go through some announcements.